The views or opinions expressed in this video are solely my own and do not necessarily reflect those of any other person or company. Hello again, good people. Here we are out in the desert at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. It's 1953, the Cold War has begun, and nuclear powers are desperate to gain any military advantage. Aircraft development was high on the agenda and speed was king. However, with high speed comes uncertainty and great risk. Today I'm looking at a research aircraft from this period, the Douglas X-3 Stiletto. Many people who love aviation have probably seen a photo of this aircraft, perhaps in a book or on a wall poster, and marvelled at its shape and obvious purpose, an aircraft to pierce the heart of an angel. Indeed, the dagger shape of this plane shows that it was meant for speed and it was intended to test aircraft capabilities around Mach 2, speeds which were pretty much unknown at the time. Unfortunately, although the airframe was capable of such an achievement, the engine was not. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so before that, let's have a look at the model here. This model of the stiletto has been produced for X-Plane 11 by Dan Hopgood and is provided as freeware on xplane.org. I'll leave a link in the comments. The model is pretty good considering that Dan says it's his first foray into 3D modelling and I would like to state right now that if I comment on any problem seen it should in no way be thought that I have anything other than admiration for someone who has given his time to this project. The model has 4K textures and FMOD sounds. It's provided with one livery, well there was only one, and also some excellent documentation including a potted history, the original handbook, much of the details of which needs to be completed by the pilot. Uh, this was an experimental aircraft after all and also provided is a supplement for X-Plane users. As I said earlier, the aircraft was designed for Mach 2 and powered by two turbojet engines. Because the proposed engine, uh, a Westinghouse J46, was also in development at the same time, when it was ready it was seen that it would be too big to put into the airframe and so the smaller J-34 had to be used instead. This left the aircraft seriously underpowered, and it not only couldn't re reach Mach 2, but it could only achieve Mach 1 during a dive. This was a major blow, and although other valuable information was gleaned from operation of the aircraft, it was generally seen as a failure. Only one aircraft was made, and the project shelved after about 50 plus test flights. With this in mind, Dan Hopgood has proposed that, with this model, the dimensionally smaller Rolls-Royce Turbomeca Arda engines could be retrofitted into the airframe. Although of course this was never done in real life, the engine would have given even better performance than the J46 so Dan has increased the model performance to match the Turbomeca and give us the aircraft that should have been. So, thanks Dan. The model has some interesting features, the first of which is how the pilot gets in. No climbing for this lazy guy. So let's get into our chariot and take it for a test flight. The seat is hydraulically lifted into the cockpit, hopefully without trapping any fingers. Well, I say hydraulically, it might be a pneumatic system or electric motors. The sound certainly sounds like electric motors, but I'm not really sure. OK, uh, before I get shouted at, I must confess to you that although you can watch the pilot descend and rise in the seat cage from an outside view, you cannot actually get in the seat and be magically transported into the cockpit. What you saw just now is the magic provided by X camera and video editing. But how cool would it be if an animation was provided to allow you to do this? Well, Dan, 
what do you say? Or perhaps in a future update. The instrument panels look good and are based on photographs taken from the original aircraft, which is now displayed at the National Museum of the USAF uh, near Dayton, Ohio. This might not be to everyone's liking, but it does give a good feel for the aircraft's vintage. All the instruments are easily recognised, and if not, they are labelled, uh, sometimes perhaps a little roughly. I think the aircraft engineer might have received a set of letter punches for his birthday. Most of the instruments are working OK. There are no navigation aids. A lot of the switches on the side panels don't work, unfortunately. There is one to jettison the drop tank and another to raise and lower the seat cage. Apparently, in the real aircraft, more instruments were placed in the nose and a cine camera used to record them for playback on the ground. That's quite incredible. OK, I'll just turn on my helmet comms and start the engines. Can you hear me OK? Down on the right uh, are the start notes in the original aircraft. However, I will be using the X-Plane supplemental notes. OK, cold start procedure. Uh, first raise the seat, enter the cockpit, which we've done. Check parachute set for takeoff. Uh, this is the parachute control and it's fine. Battery on, inverters on. Generators on. Avionics on. Engine cutoff valves on. That's these two. Fuel booster pumps on. Okay, number one igniter on and hold the start button for engine one until a thousand RPM showing on the gauge. Okay, that's number one started, and we'll do the same for number two. Number two igniter on. And hold the starter button for number two. And we check the pressures on. Expected. OK, engine started and uh, we are ready to go. So in this flight I will try to achieve its normal operating speed of Mach 2. The supplemental notes tell me how to do this, which is basically burn the fuel in the external tanks up to 40,000 feet, drop the tank, then accelerate and climb to 55,000 feet 
and Mach 2.75 should be maintained. Okay, I'll just call the tower. Edwards Tower, Experimental 92, holding on 36 right. Experimental 92, you are cleared for takeoff on 36 right. Please call flight control on 121.8, and good luck, sir. Cliff takeoff and change to 121.8. Thank you, Tower. So, uh, we will be in constant communications with the ground so they can monitor us and also guide us back to the base. Flight, this is X3 commencing takeoff on 36 right. X3, radar contact. Flaps on first stage. We are already switched to the external tank. Nose wheel up at 160 and take off at 260. Gear up. Flaps up. Okay, we start our climb and the book says we should keep to Mach 0.8. I have a red warning light telling me of low fuel, but I should have enough in the external tank to reach 40,000. My Mach number is too high. I don't want to stress the engine, so I cut the throttle a bit. OK, let's have some stats. The X3 is 66 feet 9 inches long, or 20.35 metres, and has a wingspan of 22 feet 8 inches, or 6.91 metres. It had a gross weight of uh, 20,800 pounds, or 9,435 kilograms. It had a rate of climb of 19,000 feet per minute, but that was with the J34 engines. Interestingly, the X3 weighed more than a DC-3, but had a wingspan less than the DC-3's tailplane.
I'm going to head out into the desert. Okay, good rate of climb. Flight. X3 at 40,000, ready to drop external tank. Copy, drop tank. X3. Flight. X3 has released tank, commencing climb to 55,000. Copy that, X3. Flight, X3 level at 55,000, commencing speed run. Copy Angel 55, commence run X3. So, we are in a shallow dive and increasing our speed. Mach 1. Mac 1.5 Turn two, two four zero. Two four zero, X three.
Okay, so we're turning for home and flight control will head us uh, for a landing on runway 22. that pressure wave well that was cool although I've already said that the X3 might be considered a failure that's not the whole story and it might be a little unfair the aircraft's mass was concentrated within its fuselage rather than along the wings and the aircraft suffered the dangers of roll inertia coupling. Also, because of the short stubby wings and generally unstable behaviour at low speed, much was learned that was used in the development of later aircraft, in particular the F-104 Starfighter and the F-100 Super Sabre. X-3 turn to course 220. 220, X-3. Final for runway 2215 miles, reduce speed. On final for runway 2215 miles, reducing speed, X3. Okay, let's put out the speed brake. As you would expect, the X3 has a high landing speed of around 200 knots. As well as the big barn door speed brake to slow it down in flight, it has a small parachute deployed on landing. Flaps first stage. Gear down. Perhaps second stage. More power to keep the aircraft stable above 200 knots. X3, you are clear to land runway 22, 5 miles. Clear to land on runway 22, X3. Because the view out the window is quite bad, the flight control will guide us in. X3, two miles. One mile.
Welcome back, sir. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the flight today. Uh, here we have a fascinating experimental aircraft. A flawed but still important part of aviation history. I would like to thank Dan Hopgood for providing us with this great aircraft and I look forward to seeing more from him. And so, with that, I will see you soon. Bye-bye.